Racism is the most powerful system on the planet, yet it is often perceived as the most taboo subject to discuss. World-renowned activist and best-selling author Tariq Nasheed takes on this challenge head-on in his new book, Foundational Black American Race Baiter. This is the most important book you will need in order to understand the mechanisms of systemic racism and how to counter this system. Get Foundational Black American Race Baiter now at Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Also get limited autographed collector's editions of the book at OfficialFBA.com. All right. All right, we're in here. All right. What's going on, guys? Let me just let everybody know on social media I'm live right now. And then after that, man, we're good to go. How y'all doing, family? How is the family doing? Pukyakute and Lola Vuve to the family. How are you? Shout out to the foundational Black American family and shout out to the family abroad. We're in here. Let me turn a little air on for a player. Hold on one second. Get my air together so I can really get a vibe in here with you guys. Oh, man. So we're here. Glad to have y'all tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. Glad to have everybody tuning in. We're here. We got a lot of game we're going to chop up tonight, my friends. A lot of stuff we're going to talk about tonight. Glad to have y'all tuning in. I'm just, I'm still posting stuff. Um, posting stuff on my social media that I'm going to show on tonight's broadcast. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Damn. I'm messing up here. Hold on. All right. So what's up, man? Let me see who's in this room, man. Shout out to everybody. Come on in the room. Everybody come on in here, man. So let's do this thing. Everybody come on in the room. Let's chop this game up as we always do. Got on my Biggie Smalls shirt. Shout out to Biggie Smalls. Got on the Biggie shirt. Oh, man. So what's going on, man? I hope you guys had a prosperous week. I hope uh, everybody had a productive week. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in here. All right. Um, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button, ladies and gentlemen. Say the baby got me glowing. Yes, I feel it. And shout out to everybody again. Um, thank you for everybody who got some stuff from our baby registry. All right, we still have the baby registry. We have about 20 items left. We had 120, like 123. Um, people got like 102, 103 already. I so, so appreciate the family, man. Much respect. There's a few more gifts you can get for our newborn baby that's about to be here in a few weeks. We're very excited. My wife is very, very excited. This is her first girl. You know, I have a daughter, my, my oldest daughter, who's 22 years old, my beautiful daughter, Tariri. Shout out to her. My daughter was with us last week. We went on a, um, a little short mini vacay for a couple of days in Central California. We went to the um, Sequoia Park, and then we went to um, Allensworth, as, and I talked about that last week. Oh, yeah, the link for the baby registry is right there below. You look below. It's the Amazon Baby Registry. You click that link, there's about 20 more items. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, it's our baby girl. We haven't had, I haven't had a girl in a long time. We've got a house full of boys, so this is going to be, this is going to be very interesting. My wife is buying so much pink stuff. If you look in the, the registry, it's all pink everything. My wife just couldn't wait to get girly stuff. So we got that going on. So hey, look, we, we got the link right there. The Amazon link, you guys can go there and gift um, our newborn, soon to be newborn, little quote, quote, Nisha. So we're very excited about that. Um, Y'all, share the link for the, the broadcast, by the way. Y'all put this on your social media. You know how they do. Sometimes they do little shadow bands and sometimes they play little games. So I'm going to need the family. I'm going to need you to share this broadcast, ladies and gentlemen. Share the broadcast, okay? Put it on your social media, and while you're doing that, I'm going to need you to also hit that subscribe button. 
hit that subscribe button, make that subscribe button do what it do, ladies and gentlemen. We, I'm almost at 200,000 people on my um, Twitter, not, not Twitter, on my um, YouTube. I'm almost at 200,000, ladies and gentlemen. So let's get those subscribe numbers up. We're almost at 200,000 subscribers and that will be an amazing thing, ladies and gentlemen. So tonight what we're talking about, we're talking about the tethering of our history. We're talking about how foundational black American history is tethered, it's being tethered. They have to tether on people to foundational black American history. If you go to our Twitter spaces, boy, there's been a lot of um, house cleaning when it comes to dealing with those in the diaspora. We've been doing a lot of house cleaning because we got some serious business to do with these white supremacists. And in order to replace the system of white supremacy with justice and black empowerment, we have to make sure everybody's on code and we have to understand the people who are not on code, they have to be identified and they have to be excommunicated from our circles. And that's what we're doing now. And what we're doing, we have a great movement going on. We, as foundational black Americans, we are causing the needles to move because we've done something that we've not done in a long time. We have identified our specific group. And because we've identified our specific group, a lot of people are on notice right now and a lot of people are scrambling, ladies and gentlemen. People are scrambling more than ever now because people understood that we are a different ethnic group, but they played on our desire as foundational black Americans to be unified with all black people. We're the only group who's been trying to lock hands and we shared all of our history and our lineage and our accomplishments with other groups. In fact, we almost give away our accomplishments as foundational black Americans. We sit here and give all of these groups credit for the stuff that we actually did to our chagrin. And we've done that to the point where other groups turn around and tell us that we do not have a culture. And the thing is, we are really the only group that has a culture that's significant and relevant. Not to disrespect any group, but family, we as foundational black Americans, we are the culture of the land that people run to. People run here, we are the culture of this land. Not only are we the culture, we are the builders of this land. Let's be very clear. We are not immigrants in any sense of the word. We are indigenous to the United States of America. Some of us are indigenous to North America, but all foundational black Americans are indigenous to the United States of America. What does that mean? People think, is that a Native American? Native Americans are not indigenous to the United States of America. The red-skinned Native Americans, that's who I'm speaking of. Remember, you have two groups, the red-skinned Native Americans and the black Aboriginal people. The black Aboriginal people were on this land way before the red-skinned Mongolian Native Americans. But putting that aside, the United States, we, foundational black Americans, are indigenous to the United States. Native Americans, the red ones, are not because they didn't build the United States. They had no input in the building of the United States, the red Mongolian Native Americans. It was foundational black Americans of the people who eventually became foundational black Americans. We were the ones who built this country from scratch. That's the thing that makes us more unique than any group. Don't ever let a group come around us talking about how well everybody contributed. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. We are the ones who are indigenous to the United States because we are the ones who built it from scratch. I mean, from the mud. There was no United States. We built the original bridges and the ditches and the buildings and the streets and the railroads. 
That was foundational black Americans growing the crops, growing the harvest, taming the animals, tilling the soil. That was foundational black Americans. White people cannot even make that claim, even though they had the gun and the whip on us. They didn't do the building. We did. Let's be very clear. And I always point out when the white supremacists tried to do it on their own beforehand, before we were put in place to make it happen, they failed several times. They could not and they did not do it on their own. Don't ever let that fact escape you. We are indigenous to this land. We have a unique claim to this land. We are not foreigners. And we're not guests on our own land, which is what they try to make us out to be. Now, we have been occupied by the white supremacists. We're occupied by an alien threat. That's what the white supremacists are. They are an alien threat, and they've occupied the planet, ladies and gentlemen. But that doesn't negate our accomplishments as foundational black Americans. Other groups come over and they play these games. And if y'all listen to our our Twitter live sessions, you will hear a lot of the tether classes. That means the degenerate classes of the immigrant groups, because all people from these immigrant groups are not with a tether mindset. We do have some riders, but we have to do some straightening with that tether class who come over and try to say things to us like, we don't have a culture. You foundational black Americans don't have a culture. Yet when you ask them what is their culture, they get to babbling and explaining. They know they don't have a culture. Let's keep, we're going to talk real tonight. Other groups don't really have a culture. Well, our language, okay. You have a, a native language. We have a language. The Tut language is foundational black American language. And when we were using it during antebellum slavery, we used it in private so that people would not understand what we were saying. And today we still use it in private. We don't go around bragging about it to you. We use that secret language now to communicate with each other in many circles. In our FBA room, we have a forum, a closed forum, a private forum on Facebook, a private room. In order to even get in the room, we have a Tutnese question that you have to decipher and answer to even get in the room. We still talk about that language and talk to each other in private. Certain words we'll give you, Aratisase, that's going to be the name of a holiday we're going to be celebrating later this year, ladies and gentlemen. So we do have a culture of language. So what else you got? Well, I food. From the looks of some of the people starving, I wouldn't brag about that. If you look at some of these homelands, the people are pretty hungry. I wouldn't brag about no damn food being a part of your culture. And your, your people, your grown people are running around starving. No disrespect, not disrespecting anybody. We're, we're going to just talk real tonight. We got to get this whole culture thing together. And see, this is the thing that's made us, foundational black Americans, so powerful. And this is what's making the political needle move. And I've told people this before. Before we do anything, before we even try to touch the um, political arena or any other arena, we have to get the culture sorted out of foundational black Americans. And that's what we're doing. Once we get an understanding and a, a clear grasp of our culture, everything else is going to fall into place. And that's what's happening now. Once we understand who's who, what we've done and what our culture is, we're going to start subliminally acting in ways to protect that culture and work in the same best interests of that culture. The problem is up until this point, we thought that we were on some big global African brotherhood worldwide, which is idealistic. It's not realistic. So we sat here trying to be on some, hey, we're all universal African brothers and sisters. We're going in here trying to cape for everybody and it benefits other people, but it doesn't benefit us. 
they'll go along with it as long as they're getting something out the deal. Oh yeah, yes brother, we're all universal people, African people together. So let me get some of those resources. So what happens is we're on some, yes, we all in this together, let's all help each other. What we end up doing is carrying other groups. And then once we carry them to where they need to be, to a safe space, to where they're eating good, all of a sudden, how come you Akatas don't work hard? You, you niggas are lazy. You lazy Akata. I'm a lazy Akata. I just broke my back carrying you. You understand? We help all these people and then they turn on us and then start showing disrespect and then start projecting their failed mentality and scamming mentality. We get a lot of that, ladies and gentlemen. When we got the money for the museum, we saw a lot of them show their true colors. Now, there were some, some, some non-FBA people who contributed, but when we got the money for the museum, and we're still working on the museum thing, by the way, family. You know how they are out here in California, especially Los Angeles. We're going through some Los Angeles stuff um, out there. We're trying to get the place on the Crenshaw, Lemur Park area. If you know anything about that area, Black people don't own any of the real estate, the commercial real estate. We just don't own it out there. And that's by design. Everybody who has businesses out there are leasing from the white people who own the place. But when you start trying to own that stuff, the real white people, you have to deal with the real white people. And that's what we're dealing with now. All right. We're dealing with the real white people that y'all don't know about, the ones who really don't want to sell that real estate to us. We get a whole level of red tape. The last person who actually owned the real estate off Crenshaw was Nipsey, and we saw what happened to Nipsey. All right, black folks do not own that stuff over there. All right? Black folks don't own that. But we're trying to get that popping now. I really, really want to get it out here. Again, sometimes I, I look in other cities like Atlanta. There's so many, there's a couple of spots in Atlanta that would be cool. I, I, Atlanta is going to be the second option, which is a push comes to shove. I really, 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 really want it out here. I'm just thinking out loud as far as Atlanta. If push comes to shove, if it's just so, if it gets to the point where they're just stonewalling us out here, I will have to get it in Atlanta. That's a push comes to shove scenario, which I don't want to do because it's my family. I don't like to be away from my family. I'm real big on family and we got a new baby. So I don't really want to be away from the family. No, in Atlanta, dude, there's spots in Atlanta that I can just go get right now. There's a, a bunch of spots, man. We go down to Atlanta, get that stuff refurbished. We'll get it popping down in Atlanta. But again, I don't really want to have to, you know, go back and forth and just, you know, I, I really, really want it out here. It's very important. And, and I really want it on the Crenshaw area somebody said atlanta would be good atlanta would be good it would be good but again i really want to get it out here atlanta would i can i can get it overnight in atlanta but i really want it out here i really really want it out here the first one has to be out here i really want to be it out here but we'll get it we're not tripping you know we're going to work and do what we do but even when we start getting the money, all the tethers start coming out. Where's the museum, nigga? Hey, nigga, where's the museum, nigga? This sound like a scam, nigga. Projecting their scam mentality. That's what I don't like about tethers. They stay projecting their scam mentality. And us getting that money showed how codified we were. Us raising that type of money that quickly showed how codified we were as foundational black Americans and getting it without kissing up to the white supremacists. Tethers, they look at that as almost blasphemy. You get all that money without sucking up to white people? Are these niggas magic? That's almost impossible in their minds to get that kind of money without having to suck up to the white supremacists because a lot of tethers, that's all they know. So in order for them to get money like that without sucking up to the white supremacists, they, they have to scam. And they come over here pulling their same scams. I'm not trying to beat up on people. We're just putting everything in context. There's a story somebody sent me the, the other day. And, you know, we get a lot of these Somalian sambos who call up trying to talk greasy. They really have a lot of 
vitriol towards foundational black Americans. But right here as an example, this one lady, Somalian chick out here in Los Angeles, who's been out here scamming people, Sophia Noor. She allegedly scammed influencers and faked a Jack Harlow pregnancy. This woman right here, Somalian woman, who's infamous out here, allegedly, she's been out here scamming people. They're trying to find her now, this woman here. She's a Somalian lady who's been out here scamming left and right. These folks come out, they come around as she was acting as a publicist and she was defrauding several Los Angeles influencers. Also, she was faking a pregnancy. So this woman was out here finessing everybody. All right, this is what I'm talking about. They had a hashtag about her surviving Sophia. She, somebody says she's my cousin and she scammed me and my friends. She even scammed her own family. Her own Somalian family, she scammed them. So these people, when they start talking about we're scamming and just making up these scam lies about us, remember these are projections, ladies and gentlemen. These are projections. You know, these are projections. So listen. We are the culture. These folks had to flee from what little failed culture they had. They come over here disrespecting, and then they have to tether themselves onto our culture, ladies and gentlemen. They have to tether themselves onto us. And I find it very disrespectful. Now, they got Katanji Brown. They, the, the Democrats and the, the left-wingers, they've been trying to pump her up and make her a thing. They've been trying to pump her up, this Katanji Brown, and somebody, you know, they, they keep trying to make this seem like some kind of win for black people. It is not a win for us in any sense of the word, ladies and gentlemen. And somebody put together this disrespectful image on a shirt. Some of these left wingers, some of these Democrat Negroes, they put this out. They're going to start doing sure. Remember, they did something similar with Kamala. Now they're, they're doubling down on the tethering. Rosa sat so Ruby could walk, so Kamala can run, so Katanji could rule. If y'all don't sit y'all asses down somewhere, please don't disrespect our foundational black American icons with these mammy tethers. I'm very offended by this. Kamala and Katanji don't have nothing to do with Ruby and Rosa. Rosa Parks was almost attacked by a white man, a white supremacist trying to sexually assault her, trying to turn her into a bed wench. Rosa Parks fought against that. These other two mammies are willing bed wenches. Please don't compare them to our foundational black American icons. Rosa Parks was nobody's bed wench. All right? Ruby and Rosa, that's our history. Our little Rose, Ruby, six years old, had to be protected by federal troops walking into the belly of the beast against these vile, violent white supremacists. She wasn't trying to get a date like Kamala and Katanji. Don't compare our beautiful riders, our icons, our FBA sisters to bedwinches to non-FBA bedwinches. And, and Katanji, I don't know what her background is. I'm hearing so many different reports. She's kind of secretive a little bit about her background. I'm hearing she might be non-FBA. Nobody really knows what her background is. She she claims she, she's, she's, she throws the word slavery around or whatever. Nobody really knows what Katanji's get down is. See, this is why we didn't make the block hot as far as people in their lineage. A lot of people up here hiding their lineage now because we're lineage checking people. We are lineage checking. So a lot of people are keeping that lineage. They're keeping it quiet now because we didn't make the game hot for that. We don't want people acting as our spokespersons and you come from a different lineage because most likely you're going to have dual allegiances. You're gonna have an allegiance to immigration or even the dominant white society. And we have different allegiances because, and this is another thing, watch out for these people that they keep parading around us. 
some of these new activists that y'all been seeing. I, I've seen a couple of them. I've seen a couple of these new activists that they got. This one dude who's going up against Amazon or whatever. I forgot what his name is. Watch this dude. They're, they're, this ain't no real grassroots dude. And there's another chick I saw. I'm not going to give these people any shine, but she was running around, I think, at Howard University talking about um, black this, black that, and um, student loan debt cancellation and all this. And she's Jamaican. See, we got a while. I've been looking at some of these people's background. When the, the white media, they're starting to give some of these people some shine and we don't know nothing about them. They don't come from the grassroots. They start talking black, black and start yelling and cursing. That's another thing that gives it away. When I see these people yelling and cursing and all this stuff, trying to sound hood and extra, extra black, and then all of a sudden they start talking about black trans and all of this other stuff. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh-oh. And all of a sudden they start black, 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 black. Here's my cash app. Black, 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 job turkey, black sucker. Here's my cash app. We got to watch that. We don't know. We don't know these people. We don't know these people, ladies and gentlemen. We have to question all of these people's background. And when you start looking at these weird people that nobody knows, and you start looking into their background, you start seeing the truth. Like, oh, okay, okay, okay. I see. Oh, I see you'll get down. You are a foreign tether. Okay? We got to watch these people, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? But them tethering themselves onto our history, we got to keep our eyes on these people because they have no real history that is, that is significant or no real culture that's significant. So they have to latch themselves onto the riders. No disrespect, and I'm not saying this to disrespect anybody, but we just got to do some house cleaning, ladies and gentlemen. We got to do some real house cleaning out here, man. We, we don't have time to play games with folks. We don't have time to play games. Oh, yeah, shout out to Nas Escobar. Let me show Nas Escobar's page. Let me show y'all some of these people. All right, this brother right here, I'm not trying to diss this brother, but my man Nas Escobar, and y'all follow my brother Nas Escobar, not the rapper Nas, but he's a brother, this brother's an activist, very thorough brother. He was like, yeah, this guy about the Amazon Union guy, Christian Smalls. Yeah, this guy has a, a lot of the Black Lives Matter paraphernalia on, all right? And this woman right here, this is another one. And she's another one they've been putting out there. The, the white folks been pumping her up. She goes out there talking black, black, black. And this woman has kind of said some things, kind of funny style about Foundation of Black Americans. You see, she has a black trans matter. Now, she, this is her talking. Hold on, listen to this, hold on. Black women hold the most student loan debt out of any demographic group. And we also support 80% of the black households in America, solely or mainly. So when we're talking about cancellation of student loan debt, we're talking about radically thinking about what it looks like to put financial power. Okay, when y'all, this right here is not grassroots. Okay, and this woman is Jamaican, by the way. All right? So I'm looking at these people. They're popping up. You know, they got them with, with braids and, you know, with the nose rings and all that talking black, black, black. And then they start using these real weird talking points. They start using what black women, black women and student loan debt, student loan and black trans. And these are not grassroots family. These are not grassroots people. These are white supremacist liberal think tanks. And these LGBT think tanks getting these people and they make sure they get immigrants. They make sure they get immigrants because they understand that these immigrants are not going to have no real camaraderie with us. And then they're going to come out there with all that gender divide nonsense. Women, 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 all women and black trans and give me some cash app money. No, we're not playing that game. You're not going to be our representative. You're not our representative. You cannot speak for us. You cannot speak for us. Watch these people. They're not grassroots. Remember, they got to get a whole new crop of, of, of new tethers now because we've neutralized the impact of some of the old tethers. D-Ray McKesson, his name is Mud. D-Ray can't even go nowhere and do a speech no more. 
all those folks who are out there finessing in Ferguson, we've neutralized their BS. Yeah, they got these new people. Watch them. They got a whole crop of new ones that they're trying to groom and slowly put out there. Keep your eyes open on these new tethers. All right? Y'all better keep your eyes open. There's a whole crop of them that's coming out there. All right? Her name, what's her name? Is Redis Ari or something like that? Hold on. Hold on. This, this young lady right here. You got to watch these folks. Hold on. All right. Hold on one second. And look right here, because she's been saying some things. Um, American descendants of slaves is xenophobic. That's her right there. So, yeah, these people are already on the take, family. So you got to watch these people, ladies and gentlemen. We got to be very serious. We got to have our eyes open all the time out here. This is not a joke. We cannot have these non-FBA people act as our spokespersons because they are going to undermine us. And they keep trying to tether them to our history. They have nothing to do with our history, ladies and gentlemen. They have nothing to do with our history. And all of this bedwinching that they're doing now, it's disrespectful to even compare the great Rosa Parks to these bedwinches. I'm very offended by that. But we got to understand this. And uh, these other tethers that they prop up to act at, as our spokespersons and they put them in certain political positions. What's that, that judge out there? What's her name? The, the Winsome Earl Sears, that Jamaican um, lieutenant governor. All right? That Jamaican lieutenant governor. Now, I posted this before. Remember her? She Now, the other day, last week, she was all up in the Holocaust Museum. This is her right here. Equally sombering and full of hope, the VA Holocaust Museum tells the story of those who lost, who survived the Holocaust. 1.5 million children were annihilated simply for being Jewish. May we never forget. This is her right here. May we never forget that. But when it comes, to, and this woman is Jamaican, but when it comes to foundational black Americans, Virginia's first black lieutenant governor said, we need to move on from slavery. She's telling us we need to move the hell on. So the white folks don't forget, but us, y'all need us move on. This is why these folks cannot be our representatives, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want these folks being our representatives. They cannot be our representatives at all. They have dual allegiances. Their allegiance is to white supremacy and against us. It's never a win just because there's a black face up there. Putting a black face up there saying, hey, this is a win because we have a black person in a tokenized position. That means nothing if that black face don't have a black agenda. I would rather a white person be there so we know we're dealing with white supremacy. I don't want a puppet of white supremacy. You have a black face with white supremacy in the back moving their mouths. Just put the white supremacists there. That's better. But these folks are so damn disrespectful when it comes to coming around us. Let me play this clip. I played the, I played the audio the other day, but let me play this clip of this dude. He was doing an interview. Um on the soft white underbelly, and he's a, 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 I think, Tanzanian immigrant. And listen how he talks about how foundational black Americans don't do nothing for Africa, but white people do. Hold on, listen to this. Oh, you know, Africa, you know, you get more people, more white people coming and support Africa than black people out here. You know, people having more fans out there, more funds, like, you know, well, even in documentaries, you see this on YouTube, feel me? These people talk about all this daycare and all this rah, rah all this, my bad, all these things they say and act like they really do on the cameras, but they don't, man. You get these white people that go, man. Some of them, they're not even that rich. You feel me? They just take a trip out there and they change people's life out there, man. For the low they have. It can be, man, a person working at Walgreens. Feel me? Just get his checks together and he can go back home and really make an impact to those people, man. I do because I see these blogs, man. 
I follow these people on YouTube. I see what they're doing. And I respect that. Okay. I found this particularly disrespectful. Number one, I'm going to make two very interesting points. Number one, foundation. Well, I'm, I'm going to make three points, three interesting points. I'm going to make three points in, in response to that. Number one, Foundation of Black Americans are always doing things to help Africa. Many of the movements that happen in Africa, Foundation of Black Americans were the ones starting the movements. A lot of the revolutionary movements, it was Foundation of Black Americans going out there planting the seed of some of those revolutionary movements. Some of the freedom struggles, it was Foundation of Black Americans with apartheid in Africa. In South Africa, it was Foundation of Black Americans boycotting some of those venues out there in South Africa, letting the world know we're not going to play places like Sun City and other places that's practicing apartheid against the people. It was Foundation of Black Americans standing up to that. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was Foundation of Black Americans riding for Mandela? Or was Foundation of Black Americans putting in work, upholding many movements out there. It's Foundation of Black Americans holding up the history of Africa. Foundation of Black Americans, John Henry Clark, Ashra Kwesi, Anthony Browder, so many Foundation of Black Americans going over there and keeping the history of Africa alive, elevating Africa. It was Foundation of Black Americans doing that. It was Foundation of Black Americans going over there, taking tour groups over there, feeding the economy, showing them some of the ancient artifacts, teaching them some of the history. It was Foundation of Black Americans doing that. It was Foundation of Black Americans, myself included, donating to so many different causes over there, orphanages, myself included, women's farmers groups, myself, I've donated thousands of dollars to women's farmers in, uh, in Zimbabwe. We're always donating money, giving, yeah, Renoko Rashidi, yes. Doing tours over there, taking black people over there, feeding the economy there. For this dude to fix his mouth to say that, do y'all know how disrespectful that is? Not only was that disrespectful to turn around and say, not, you niggas don't do nothing for us, but the white people do. Really, fool? And truth be told, a lot of them have that mentality that it's the white people that's really, really helping them, not us. The white people do more. Fool, y'all have not figured out the con game that the white supremacists run over you, run on you. They go over there skinning and grinning, over there giving you a couple of bags of grain or whatever. And then they'll set up shop and then drain all your damn resources and cause you to flee. And you still up here giving them props. You haven't even figured out the con game yet. It's a, a, a new millennium now and you still have not figured out the con game that they didn't run on you out there. Yeah, Oprah Winfrey, even Oprah had that school out there talking about what we haven't done for them. But the white people, oh, you got to give props. And these are the people that has caused the devastation in your homeland. They're the ones indirectly controlling and devastating your economy. They've, they've controlled you to the point where they control you on autopilot. They don't even have to be there. They're controlling you by remote control. Click, click. They're remote control controlling you. Y'all haven't figured that out? And then when you ask them, brother, what's going on in your homeland, man? How come y'all are not getting it together? How come y'all not getting it together over there in your homeland, man? Why y'all not getting on code with each other, man? It's a bunch of you guys. Y'all can get on code, man. Why y'all not doing your thing over there? They give you the same answer. Government, the government, it's the government, it's the government, the government, the government, it's the government, it's the government, it's the government, it's the government. It's the government, nigga. 
It is not white supremacy. It is the government. No, there's no white people here. There's no white supremacy here at all. It is these niggas in the government. Who do you think controls the government? It's the white supremacists controlling your government leaders. Let's be very clear. And family, here's the third most important point. Here's the third point. Hit the like button, ladies and gentlemen. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button, ladies and gentlemen. Retweet this broadcast. Share it right now on Twitter. Share it. Here's the kicker. We don't actually owe you anything in Africa. That's the killing part. The fact that you're so arrogant, and not all of you, but just the fact that some of you are so arrogant to even imply that we owe you something, that's equally disrespectful because let's be clear, y'all sold the few black people who came here. You sold us to the white supremacists. You sold some of us, many of us were already here, but that 4%, 3 or 4% that came over, you sold them to the white supremacists. You didn't try to come get us. You didn't create a lane or you didn't create any kind of land allotment to say, hey, if you want to come on back, come on back here. You didn't claim nobody. You kind of threw us to the wolves, washed your hands, left us for dead, and then it turned around and bit you in the ass. The same people you sold us to, they turned around and colonized all of you. You, you understand? It's like a crack mother. You sold your baby for crack to a white trick. Then the baby somehow got it together, got strong, and then became somewhat successful relatively. And then the crack mother wants to come back around. Hey, baby, I'm still your mama now. You got to love me. Come on now. You got to do for me. Give me your VCR. I'm your mama. No. No, no, no. We're not playing the, the crackhead mother thing. If anybody owes something, something, y'all owe us. That's why the whole concept of anybody, especially from anywhere in Africa, getting some reparations. No, no, no. Because we need to start cracking open those books to see who sold who, what, what tribe, what village, who did the selling. All right? We need to see who was selling who. The crackhead mother thing. My bad, my bad. Yeah, we need to start seeing who sold who, ladies and gentlemen. The game is real out here. See, yeah, we got a clean house, ladies and gentlemen. We have to clean house, and that's what we're doing right now. We are cleaning house, and it's starting here. But we got to understand that we are the culture here, ladies and gentlemen. Foundation of Black Americans, we are the culture. And other people, they just have to, to, to tap in and tether to our culture. And we're saying no more. We're saying no more. We're just not with that. Because we're already dealing with the battle out here. We got a lot to deal with out here. Right now, these white supremacists are on the move. They're using a lot of propaganda against us. Like I said, that, that shooting that happened in New York a few, day, a few days ago, I told people there's a lot of questionable stuff about that. And I've been telling people, all of these crimes you see in New York, Many of these crimes are being manufactured for propaganda reasons. We have to understand. I don't want black people to think that that's far-fetched or that's beneath the white supremacist family. Do y'all know anti-black racism is a trillion dollar industry? Do you realize how much money there is just on a local level in anti-black racism? Family, we got to understand this. Them criminalizing us and making us the face of um, danger there's a lot of money in that. And notice, I want y'all to notice something. A lot of that happens. You're seeing it happen in two places mainly. You're seeing it happen 
in the San Francisco Bay Area of California and in New York. Now, why those two places? These are supposed to be liberal places. And both of these liberal places were hit hard with the protest and the defunding uh, movement. So a lot of their money was, was tapped into. So now they're using propaganda to, to get their money back even stronger than ever. So you'll see a lot of stuff in San Francisco, all of these weird anti-Asian crimes where you got black folks who are in clearly staged scenarios committing these crimes and they're always committing these crimes right on film. Now, what's unique about San Francisco? Number one, a lot of experiments come out of San Francisco. Number two, around the Bay Area in California, there's a lot of prisons around the Bay Area, okay? The prison economy is a gazillion dollar industry. There are a lot of prisons around the Bay, Northern California. You know, they got Pelican Bay, um, Folsom, San Quentin, Oh, they got a lot of them. A lot of them around the Bay, um, Northern California, a lot of prisons. I want y'all to understand this. In New York, the prison game in New York, there's a lot of money in the New York prison game. They make billions of dollars in New York alone with the prisons out there. All right? Now, here's the thing. Yeah, Tracy Prison, yeah. Yeah, listen to me. There's a lot of prisons around the Bay Area. And the prison economy in New York is heavy. Here's the thing. You got these prisons that are designed to bring in billions of dollars every year. They have to feed the prison system. Alcatraz, real talk. It's not functioning, but you know you feel what I'm saying. Solano, yeah, Solano County. But they got to feed that prison system. Black people, contrary to, um, to propaganda, black people are not committing a lot of crimes. That's why they always have to point to Chicago. Whenever they talk about black crime, they always got to mention Chicago. But outside of Chicago, black people are not committing a lot of crimes. But they have to justify criminalizing us. They have to justify it. They have to feed those prisons. You got stockholders, you got these people, man, you got to feed these prisons. You got to have criminals. So part of white supremacy, you can't criminalize white people because that'll make everything crumble. Too many white people will, fi will fight against it. You got white people doing all these rapes. That's why they're trying to decriminalize rape and pedophilia so that these white folks won't be fed into the prison system. This is why they're decriminalizing drugs, meth, and fentanyl where all these white people are doing it, you can't criminalize them. But you got to criminalize us. And not only do they make money just housing all of these black people, they make money, especially in New York, they made hundreds of millions of dollars in New York alone just from selling the products that the black people and other inmates um, produce in the prisons. Understand, they produce products in these prisons. They produce like the hand soap that's used in all the federal buildings in prison. In New York, they produce tissue, all this stuff. Man, it's a gazillion dollar business. So you have to criminalize people. So you have to justify criminalizing people. So if people are not committing crimes in a place like New York, like you need them to be, if black people are not out here committing crimes, you have to manufacture crimes. It's nothing for them to go get some homeless people and pay them to go commit crimes on camera. Go out here and knock somebody out so that the news can portray this in the media. Oh, look how dangerous these black people are. Now, right after that, that shooting out there, that, and they used it as propaganda, right after that shooting, Curtis Sliwa, the founder of the Guardian Angels, who's a, an anti-black racist, he got on TV and said what I said they were going to say. Listen to this. That's a continuation. It's like every day. Uh, I'm in the subways. It's crawling into the belly of the beast. It's a combination of Dante's Inferno 
And remember, Jack Nicholson and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Everywhere. Terror reigns. And this mayor has not gotten control of it. It's worse than it was with the prior mayor. And they got to lock down this system. They got to do the things that Rudy Giuliani did to bring this city back from the murder capital of America to the safest big city. And that means stop and frisk. That means traffic stops. That means proactive policing. And they're not doing it mm. to the safest big city. And that means stop and frisk. That means traffic stops. That means proactive police. Okay, watch the stop and frisk. Proactive police meaning you just start stepping to people and criminalizing them. Listen, proactive policing means step to black people and escalate a situation until it becomes a crime. All right, that's what proactive policing means. Step to black people, escalate the situation, and then criminalize them. Meaning you step to a black person and start questioning them and then make up a crime. Oops, you're resisting, I gotta arrest you. Stop and frisk, that's where it's all going back to, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you. That's where it's going back to. That's what they've been wanting to do anyway. They gotta do that stop and frisk. They have to, it's back, it's slave catching, basically. It's slave, stop and frisk is slave catching. Stop and frisk, it's slave catching. If you see a black person, because as we know, the last stop and frisk fiasco, it was all black people mostly. Damn that black and brown. It was black people, it wasn't no brown. It was mostly black people they were stopping. And they're trying to justify it now, ladies and gentlemen. They gotta feed that prison system. Black folks, you got to stop going along with people when they're using propaganda against you. You don't go along with people when they use propaganda against you. They are using propaganda to justify slave catching, ladies and gentlemen. That's all this is. This is more slave catching. All right? And the, the Republicans and the Democrats are all on code with this slave catching. Now... We don't have no friends in the Democrats, the Democratic Party. For example, look at this. And when it comes to us getting our resources, boy, they're real funny stuff. Now, this happened out here in, speaking of San Francisco, this happened in San Francisco, in liberal San Francisco. All right? This happened in liberal San Francisco. Hold on one second. Let me get this stuff together real quickly. Let me show you all some things. There was a brother who had some discrimination against him, some racial discrimination at, um, what company was he with? Hold on, let me show you the thing here. At Tesla, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> this brother was working for Tesla and he faced racial discrimination. Hold on. Let me show y'all this guy here, hold on. Hold on one second, all right. Hold on one second, hold on one second. Let me show something, hold on. I wanna show y'all something here. I'm gonna show y'all your, your liberals and your progressives and all of that stuff. Hold on one second. So this brother faced discrimination out here. And um, hold on, let me show y'all something. Hold on one second. Where is this? I'm trying to, I'm looking for something. Da, 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 da. Hold on one second. Let me find something before I go there. I, I want to have all my receipts ready. All right. Okay, there we go. This is what I'm looking for. All right. So this is this right here. Let me show you. This brother right here. This brother right here. He was working for Tesla and they were calling him all types of N words at the job. Um, what's his name? Diaz, his last name is Diaz, Owen Diaz. So this brother right here was being called the N-word. They were saying N-words ain't this, N-words ain't that. So this brother went to court, went to trial. The jury awarded this dude $137 million. Huge payout. The white judge said, oh no, I know what the, the jury and the court awarded you, but I think that's too excessive. So the white judge, Judge William Oreck of San Francisco, he said, let me slash that. I'm going to slash that $139, $136 million. I'm going to slash that down to just $15 million. 
finding the previous verdict excessive. Boy, when it comes to us, when it comes to us getting some resources, boy, they know how to jump in there and run interference, right? This is why we need reparations right here. The minute they'll talk all of this symbolic nonsense, but when it comes to tangibles, boy, they'll come run interference big time. Now, this guy, this judge, this is this judge here, William Oreck, out there in San Francisco. Now, William Oreck was put on his seat by Barack Obama, ladies and gentlemen. Barack Obama put this guy on his seat. All right, this is your boy Barack. But representation matters, right? So thank you, Barack. This is another L that Barack has given us, given us, ladies and gentlemen. That's another L that Barack and the Democrats have served us. All they do is serve us L's, ladies and gentlemen. That's all they do. But family, we got to understand the game out here. They'll do all of this symbolic nonsense. And this judge, they got him out there. He's running around talking about police reform, this police reform, that. They'll do all of this symbolic nothing burger nonsense. But when it comes time for us to get a real bag, boy, they start running interference big time. That's why we, we got to be on code as foundational black Americans, man. We got to be extremely on code, ladies and gentlemen. We got to be hella on code. So us gatekeeping our culture is extremely important. Us gatekeeping our culture is extremely important. Because what happens is we sit here and we allow people to tether on to us and we don't say nothing. And we got to start calling this stuff out. I saw some posts before, and this is another thing about our music. See, we got to start gatekeeping our music again. I saw something where, I don't know if some white supremacists posted this. They were trying to talk about how the, the uh, Italians influence on jazz music. See, somebody was also on Twitter talking about how Filipinos contributed to some damn hip hop. We're going to have to gatekeep all of that, ladies and gentlemen. All of the music genres we created, we're just going to have to put that FBA stamp on all of it. And we're going to have to put it on there hard. All right? Family, this is why we have to know history. Let's be very clear. We got to gatekeep everything. No other culture did anything to influence our foundational black American creations. Nobody created hip hop but us. Yes. They're trying to run around saying some damn Italians created jazz. And that was a lie that they got started in the, the, the 1900s, the early 1900s. That was a lie they came up with. And they're trying to reboost that lie. So I'm telling y'all now, if y'all ever hear that lie, shut it on down with facts. They're trying to revamp the Italian started um, jazz lie. Okay, let's be very clear. We got to clean that up. Now, as we know, jazz started in New Orleans um, in the 1800s, coming after slavery, after the Civil War. You had a lot of black people down in New Orleans. There's a couple of things. Let, let's do some music history real quick. Let's, let's just get it all together. <clears throat> down in New Orleans, you had a different mixture of things with the black people that contributed to jazz. You had the Creoles down there who were kind of distancing themselves from black people, but they were learning how to play the clarinet and certain wind instruments. They were learning how to play formal music. They had these Creole bands. And you also had black folks who came in from St. Louis who were playing ragtime. They were bringing ragtime down there to New Orleans. Also, after the Civil War, you had a lot of brass instruments left over from the military, okay? The military army, you know, they would play the trumpets and play the, the trombone and they would play these brass instruments for the, in, the, the, the military. So after the Civil War, all of these instruments are laying around Black people, former slaves, picked them up, started to learn how to play. Uh, 
they started playing the blues. They started playing gospel with, with, with horns and trumpets. They were getting down and all of this was starting to meld, to gel into what would become jazz. Then at the turn of the century, the late 1800s, there was a situation with the Creoles. The Creoles got a wake up call. The Creoles were like the Cullets in South Africa, but they got a wake up call. The Creoles got a wake up call in the in 18 the 1890s in a very landmark case um Plessy what was it was it Homer was what was it Homer versus Plessy which one was it was it Plessy versus Ferguson what was that case I'm trying to get my history right I want to get that history. I think it was Plessy versus Ferguson. Yeah, 1896. It was Plessy versus Ferguson. Now, Homer Plessy was a, a Creole. He thought he could pass for white. And they had um, implemented the separate but equal law down there. And they were saying that black people couldn't ride the trains with white people. You had to ride separately. So this Creole, who could kind of pass for white, he tried to, um, hold on one second, I'm looking at some stuff. Yeah, he tried to test that law. Yeah, Plessy versus Ferguson. Homer Plessy, that's his name. He's Creole. So he tried to get on that train, said, I'm going to test it out. I'm going to get on this train. I, I look kind of white. So he refused to sit on the car with the black people. He didn't want to get on the black car. But I think one of the porters recognized him, like, hey, my nigga, what you doing? You're supposed to be in the back. So they outed him. And then the white folks was like, nah, you got to get your ass back there with the rest of the Negroes. They took that to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, hey, we got to uphold this. You black, all that Creole stuff, we don't know nothing about that. Your ass is black. Get your light-skinned ass back there with the rest of the Negroes. So overnight... The Creoles, the, their buffer status got reneged. The Creoles got lumped in with the black folks. So out there, they had to bring their brass instruments. They had to bring their clarinets and all of their formal training to get down with some of those, those black bands and some of those black people who were formulating what jazz was. All right? They got their Negro wake-up call. So now you got the Creoles and you got the other foundation of black Americans all working together now musically. They, they're putting their instruments together. They're doing their thing and they're formulating jazz. Around the year 1915, there was a, a, a jazz player and I think he might've been a black Creole or whatever, but he was from New Orleans. I think he was from New Orleans, I think. Um, Freddie Keppard, they called him King Keppard, phenomenal jazz player. They wanted him to make a record in 1915, I think. They wanted him to make a record, King Keppard, because you had jazz artists going on the road doing their thing. You had a lot of folks doing their thing in the early stages of jazz. King Keppard did not want to make a record. It was Victor, the Victor Recording Company wanted him to make a record. He didn't want to make a record because he was like, hey, y'all going to steal my stuff. And he would make his money on the road. So he was like, if I make a record and y'all sell my record, people are going to steal my style. He was real big on people not stealing his style. He, was, he would play and cover his hands so people wouldn't see the notes he was hitting. So he turned them down. He could have been the first person to make a jazz record. So the next year, Victor Records, they went and got another group out of New Orleans, which was a white group with some Italian guys in it. And this group was called the Original Dixieland Jazz Band. And the original Dixieland Jazz Band, they recorded a tune that was popular among black people in New Orleans, and they recorded the first jazz record. The record blew up. First time jazz was on record. Now, these lying-ass white supremacists went around the world claiming that they created jazz. See? They went around the world talking about, yeah, we're the creators of jazz music. And then they started doubling down. They were like, jazz is a white man's music. Negroes didn't have nothing to do with it. Do you think Negroes could play like this? So that lie got started with them. 
And people found out it was a lie later on. They figured out, okay, these jazz has been around for a long time. And plus, that group fell off. They couldn't maintain any hits like that. So they got outed. You understand? But they were trying to spread that lie then. They were trying to take our culture. They vultured our culture. And they were trying to steal it then. So we have to check people. We have to put a gate around our culture. Because, see, the minute we even step in their arena, just like last week, we're talking about that those white boys winning the best reggae album at the Grammys. The white boys won the best reggae album. Now they come in and they infiltrate our movements and steal our stuff all the time. But you go around their venues, listen how folks talk. Now listen to this suspected white supremacist talking about Monica and um, Mackey. I think, it's, what's his name? David, I, I forgot what the brother's name is. He's an actor. I, his Mackey, I know his last name is Mackey, but they were hosting the Country Music Awards show. Now listen to this suspected white supremacist talk about that. They don't want us around their mix. Now listen to him. This is Patrick Howley talking about Monica and this other black actor hosting the Country Music Awards. Hold on. This uh, award show was really kind of a train wreck. There was uh, a chick who was uh, co-hosting it, and they said that she tested positive for the Rona. So let's uh, take a, a look last night. I know all of you were I don't know who this black guy is who's hosting it. It's supposed to be country music. No offense. I mean, y'all have hip hop and basketball. You know what I mean? It's like, just fly with your flock, bro. I'm not against you, but you're up here being like, the melanated people invented country music. At the CMT, we was making country music in Wakanda before. Oh, we, we, we did create country music, so I know he's trying to troll, but we did create country music. Jack Hash and Merle Haggard done stole the black man's country music. It's like, all right, bro. It's so angry. There were so many black people there. Sorry to say, but like so many black celebrities who have nothing to do with country music. And it's like, why? No disrespect to uh, to the, the funky brothers of, of, of music. I love Earth, Wind and Fire, Run DMC, etc. But I mean, like country music's different. Country music's different. It's not Wakanda. Okay. So they love talking that Wakanda talk when it comes to us. We ain't got nothing to do with no damn Wakanda. Okay, yeah, our Wakanda is here. We're foundational black Americans, buddy. Our Wakanda is right here. All right? But, but listen, it's important for us to understand our culture. It's important for us to understand people trying to infiltrate our culture, bringing in tethers, bringing in other agendas, ladies and gentlemen. It's important for us to understand what they're doing and to sideswipe it and to sidestep it, not let people infiltrate us with some of these other agendas. They always have to tether it on to us. Um, speaking of that, and I, I won't even say too much about this, as the saying goes, a picture says a thousand words. This is um, Dwayne Wade and Gabby and their kids and their kids' dates. All right. These are the dates of their kids. One kid got a zaddy already. This is why when people start talking about intersectionality, uh, we already, we know what that means. So I'm not going to even speak too much on this. A picture says a thousand words. I'll just show that and I'll leave that there. All right. I'll leave that there. Another picture that I saw right here. This looks like one of these um, alternative couples right here with a baby and they got a, they had a birthday party or whatever with a crucified white Jesus. This looks like one of them, a stud couple with a baby and the baby looks like, hey man, what the hell is going on? The baby knows something is wrong here. And I'm getting some non-FBA vibes on these two studs, by the way. Allegedly, allegedly, I don't know what they are. Allegedly, I say allegedly. But right here, even the baby knows. This kid right here knows something ain't right. Family. Boy, the white supremacists, boy, they, they orchestrate all types of numbers on us. They orchestrate all types of numbers and doozies on us, ladies and gentlemen. It's insane. And by the way, I talked about this on my social media. I talked to Bill Cosby on the phone um, last week. I talked to Bill Cosby on the phone. Um, 
it was me, a couple other people on the phone, um, his spokesperson, I'm, I mistakenly said that Andrew Wyatt was his lawyer. Andrew's not his lawyer, he's, he's his spokesperson. And we had a very great conversation. Shout out to Mr. Cosby, shout out to Sister Camille Cosby. Uh, we, I heard her in the background while I was talking to Mr. Cosby. Um, very nice brother, man. Um, he was dropping some very heavy game. Um, he's in good spirits, man. He's still very humorous, man. He was cracking jokes, man. We were chopping it up. Had a very good conversation. Um, Mr. Cosby was dropping some very heavy game about how people who promote black families and black family structures are usually targeted by the media. We were talking about the Will Smith slap and how you know they were kind of looking for an angle to go in on Will Smith anyway because Will did a movie and he won an Oscar for the movie and the movie was really about black families. So they were really looking for an angle to get in on Will. So you know, Will kind of walked into that one. But but Dr. Bill, yeah, Dr. Bill, yes, he's a doctor, but Dr. Bill Cosby is in very good, good, good spirits right now. Um, chopping up very good game. He's doing very, very good. And uh, we had a very pleasing conversation. And we, we'll, we're going to talk again pretty soon. But shout out to Mr. Bill Cosby, Dr. Bill Cosby. I want him to keep his head up. You know, we're still riding for him out here on the grassroots. Um, his, his son, Ennis, his birthday, Ennis's birthday was a couple of days ago. So RIP, rest in power to Brother Ennis Cosby. And again, um, you know, I'm not co-signing any of those false allegations. And I look at black people funny style for co-signing that. You believe anything white people tell you? I don't co-sign false allegations, especially with people who've been proven to be liars. You understand? So they rightfully threw that bogus case out and I don't co-sign any black person getting bogus charges thrown on them. Nobody deserves that, especially black people. Yes, indeed. But um, anywho, you remember last week, <laughs> um, speaking of non-FBA tethers, Remember, I put I put up a picture of them in one of these African countries. They tried to do some things. It was a they put out a story that a mermaid washed up on the shore. They put up a story about a damn mermaid, and this mermaid looked questionable. <laughs> I posted this the other day. They they had this about a mermaid. They said a mermaid washed up on shore. They said this was in Cape Town, South Africa. So they said a mermaid washed up on shore. Let me play this, hold on. They were asking, is it real or fake? So I'm like, my thing is if, now it, it could be real or it could be a hoax. My thing is if you're gonna have a mermaid, how you gonna, if it's a hoax, how you gonna spend all that money you spent all that money on a mechanical tail and you spent $3 on some synthetic bundles. My thing is, how you gonna put all that money in a hoax? You, you made a mechanical tail and you got a cheap ass Sally's Beauty Supply wig to put on the damn mermaid and you messed the whole hoax up. Look at this. Now you, you know good and well you could have done better than this. <laughs> You got a, a, a mechanical, you spent $500 on a mechanical tail and $2.50 on some Auburn bundles. <laughs> you got some Auburn bundles that don't even match. How dare you disrespect us with a hoax? But again, like I said, family, it could be real because I heard there was another sighting, ladies and gentlemen. There was another sighting out here on the West Coast, by the way of another mermaid, ladies and gentlemen. There was another mermaid sighting, from what I heard, and somebody sent the picture of this mermaid sighting. And I don't know, family, I'm out here in California, so I'm kind of scared. So there's another mermaid right here, and this mermaid washed up out on Venice Beach. So ladies and gentlemen, we gotta be careful out here. I'm just saying, if you go to the beach, the weather's getting warm, be careful out here, because this mermaid has a bayang. So we gotta be careful out here, ladies and gentlemen. It has a some claws and a bayang. So so family, this one looks poisonous. 
it has a poisonous bayang. So be careful out here on the beach with this one, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want nobody to get hurt. I don't want you to get bit by a mermaid with a bayang. So please be careful out here, guys. It's dangerous out here. Watch your kids. Watch your kids, people. Please watch your children. Or it could be a merman. I don't know. The face is kind of strong. It might be a merman. So I got to respect the mermaid's pronouns, okay? I'm going to respect the mermaid's pronouns. <laughs> it's a merman, probably. I don't know. But anyway. Anyway, y'all, that's been... <laughs> That's been today's broadcast. <laughs> Go to Amazon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> get the, the baby registry stuff. Go to officialfba.com to get the um, maroon flag t-shirts, ladies and gentlemen. And go to eructasussy.com to get the eructasussy shirts. And um, go to um, amazon.com to get my book, Foundational Black American Race Beta. It's been real, ladies and gentlemen, man. Much respect to you guys. Puppy Okute and Lola Vuve to the family.